Why do we value mining companies? And why is valuation of mineral assets different to that of other assets? It's because the risk associated with a mining asset is generally far more risky than that involved with other businesses. The risk of the resource, that is, uh, the geologist's estimate of uh, the amount of metal in the ground, outweighs all other risks. And it's important to understand that any uh, numbers that you see involved in mining are estimates. There are no hard numbers in mining. Another point uh, when you're reading documentation uh, that would pay to keep in mind is that any report you see that refers to resource or reserve calculations must be treated with suspicion. Any competent or qualified person understands that these are estimates and refer to them as such. In English we have many words to express the same thing, but there is a significant difference between a calculation and an estimate. A calculation implies uh, accuracy, whereas an estimate is something that uh, does not uh, necessarily imply accuracy. If you have a look at the photograph of the miners uh, on the left hand side of this slide, the man second from the right is my grandfather. In front of him is a large pile of gold. He took a significant risk in the 1930s by raising capital, buying mining equipment, driving into the middle of the Australian desert and was rewarded with a significant fortune in gold. Equally, had he failed, he could have died of starvation in that desert. He understood the nature of risk and uh, through my family history, I certainly understand the nature of risk involved with mining. And this is something that I apply to the valuations that I perform. What goes wrong and what is failure? Failure is when reality does not match the model. Typically in mining, grades may not be as expected schedules and plans will not be met because people have taken unrealistic approaches to productivity. Costs will be higher because of this low productivity. The production is not covering the cost of fixed costs. Recovery, metallurgical recovery is lower. As an example in Kalgoorlie, uh, in the summertime, a Kalgoorlie gold plant uh, using cyanide can be expected to recover 93% of the gold in the ore that is presented to it. In the winter time, if the metallurgist is not compensating for the change in ambient temperature, uh, that recovery can drop to 87%. That 6% difference in metallurgical recovery translates to a 20% difference in revenue. And that typically is the margin for the mining project. So the complexity of uh, most mining projects and the technical aspects of these projects require that careful analysis is made in order to form an appropriate valuation. How bad can it be? An Australian study by uh, two of my colleagues uh, of nine underground mines found that only half achieved planned throughput by the third year after startup. A similar US study found that 35% of those mines never achieved planned production rates. In 2003, again McCarthy, who I consider to be one of the foremost thinkers in the Australian mining industry, uh, found that of 41 underground mines, 60% of the ore reserve estimates fell outside the expected range. Now that is significant. If you are a financial analyst or an investor, you must understand uh, that these estimates all carry a significant risk of being incorrect. But then how good can it be? Two recent Australian examples, Sandfire Resources and Sirius Resources, uh, each of these companies uh, successfully and rapidly developed uh, significant base metal uh, deposits in Western Australia. In the case of Sandfire, a copper lead zinc deposit with gold is paying dividends to its shareholders. In the case of Sirius Resources, a nickel discovery has recently been sold uh, at a very advantageous price uh, and that cash has been returned to the shareholders. So when things work, mining projects work very well.
The key thing to understand is the concept of engineering tolerance. We're dealing with a technical subject, geology or mining or metallurgy, uh, and any engineer understands the degree of tolerance attached to any estimate or any uh, technical work that they might do. The uh, uh, tolerance of any engineering uh, calculation or estimate uh, is a statistically determined distribution. In the case, for example, of a conceptual study, a scoping study, which is based on inferred resources, the level of accuracy attached to this sort of study is going to be between plus and minus 35 to 50 percent, somewhere beyond one standard deviation other, the either side of the mean, the mean being the actual value in this case. In the case of a feasibility study, uh, based on a measured resource from which proved reserves may be estimated, the accuracy is going to be plus or minus 10 to 15 per cent. Half a standard deviation either side of the actual result. The difference between a conceptual and a feasibility study is quite significant. The amount of engineering work, the amount of data that's required to inform this uh, is phenomenally greater. Next we'll move to the mining cost cycle. Significant capital is expended early on in the mine, life of the mine uh, or the project, uh, firstly to identify the ore body, exploration risk capital money that is put forward uh, with a significant uh, risk that there may be no return. Once a decision is made to progress with that project, an, a far greater amount of money is then expended on construction of a process plant. This is capital that must be paid back. It's not risk capital or sunk capital, it is an investment. Bankers, financiers typically require a payback for this capital expenditure of between three and five years. This payback is uh, derived from the margins early on in the life of the mine. Generally, these margins are predicated on ore that is easy to uh, mine and for geological reasons, often of a significantly higher grade than that to be exploited during the life of the mine. Anyone who's familiar with discounted cash flows will understand that at a reasonable discount rate, something like 10% in the case of a mining project, there is very little value ascribed to cash flow beyond eight or 10 years. Therefore, your real net present value, your real cash flow for a mining project is derived in the first five or perhaps eight years. This is the money that is required to pay back your capital. If there is significant risk that this value can't be realised in this short period of time, then the project is inherently risky and does uh, stand a good chance of failure. So the importance of those first three to five years cannot be overstressed. In most projects, this is where the value is to be found. This brings us to the Jork Code. As a member of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, I am obliged in my professional practice to consider the Jork Code at all times. The Jork Code defines for me exploration results and mineral resources and the confidence that I express in these um, resource classifications. Inferred, indicated and measured, and as a mining engineer, applying what's called the modifying factors to uh, identify the economically viable proportion of those resources as reserves, classified as either probable or proved. Referring back to the slide uh, showing engineering tolerance and uh, the degree of confidence that is implied by these different classifications. There are no hard and fast rules around this. However, this is generally understood to be the degree of confidence that a mining professional uh, can um, uh, lay on these various resource and reserve classifications. 
these classifications consequently attract different valuations according to the confidence in their estimation. An inferred resource will attract a far lower value than a measured resource. Same with a reserve. A probable reserve will attract a lesser value than a proved reserve. And I, as a valuer, uh, will act accordingly and discount the uh, reserves and resources of the projects that I'm valuing according to my view of the validity of those estimates. The resources, and particularly the reserves, are defined during a series of well understood scoping studies, uh, uh, technical studies I'm afraid. The uh, JORC code defines each of these studies. A scoping study is a preliminary evaluation of a project. Its level of engineering accuracy is at a fairly low level of confidence. Enough to demonstrate viability for the project, but not enough for a financier to uh, invest with any degree of confidence. The question is to be answered is whether the project is viable or not. Relative cost of this exercise, perhaps a quarter of a million Australian dollars. The resources at this stage would probably be mostly inferred, maybe some indicated resource estimates included in it. The JORC code defines reserves as being estimated at a minimum by a pre-feasibility study. The accuracy of this study is an order of magnitude greater, 20, 25%. Relative cost might be twice that of the scoping study. However, in this case, we're using real numbers uh, and far tighter capital and operating cost estimates in order to come up with a single uh, plan to advance the project. The JORC code says that this is the minimum study required for the estimation of reserves. Finally, the feasibility study. Some people call this a bankable feasibility study. It's not a term that I like to use because bankable has no definition under the JORC code. However, the intention is to provide uh, and demonstrate the economic and practical viability of the project to the extent that capital can be lent against that project with some degree of confidence of an acceptable return. The implied accuracy is between 10 or 15 per cent. Significantly, various studies have demonstrated that a successful feasibility study will cost around about 5% of the capital cost of a particular project. So if you spend 5% of your capital on the studies required to demonstrate the viability of a project, then you are more than likely to have a study that has some high degree of confidence attached to it. Most of this money is spent on the metallurgy. The mining methods, equipment selection, other aspects of the project are fairly simple in most cases and have mostly been demonstrated in the pre-feasibility study. It's the metallurgy and the example I gave earlier of uh, variation in metallurgical recovery in Kalgoorlie, it's the metallurgy that defines confidence in a return, in a margin. A small change in metallurgical recovery leads to a significant variation in your expected margin and cash flow. That is why these studies cost a considerable amount of money. Metallurgy is not cheap. Other issues that require investigation uh, are marketing, which is very significant given recent behaviour of, for example, uh, iron ore projects. There are a significant number of projects that are producing a product that no longer has a market due to the changes uh, in the customer's requirements over the last three to five years. Legal, environmental and social impacts of a particular project are investigated at this stage. And in order to estimate proved reserves, all of these matters have to be settled with absolute certainty.
Well, the advantage of engaging a firm like Snowden or um, any of our uh, uh, tier one, if you like, uh, associates such as AMC, uh, not necessarily competitors, uh, because I view those firms as uh, uh, more being colleagues uh, rather than competitors, is you don't only get the individual and the experience of that individual. individual. These firms tend to hire uh, the best people that they see, but they are supported by teams of other professions. So I have uh, capacity uh, behind me, other professionals engaged in environmental science, metallurgy, uh, geology, uh, resource estimation, and uh, um, geotechnical engineering. I have access to all of this, as well as mechanical engineering and estimation. Consequently, these tier one terms or tier one firms may not necessarily provide the cheapest reports. However, uh, that uh, depth of analysis uh, means that the reports provided are undoubtedly uh, the most robust and that's what you're paying for. I've recently been advising a Chinese client who has effectively lost 400 million dollars on a ill-conceived project. My comment there was had at the start of that investment uh, they engaged a tier one firm at a cost of uh, a couple of tens of thousands of dollars they'd be $400 million richer. So in the scheme of things, even though the fees charged may initially seem to be high, but really they're not, uh, the result is significant reduction in risk uh, and uh, um, the ability to safeguard your capital.